All right, time's up. We got to get going. <laughs> We're on a time schedule. We're already behind. Now, at this time, I'd be very honored to introduce our first speaker, and it is Don Musalem, but uh, she just call her Dr. Don. She said, um, and we'll have a great talk on the essence of vibrant existence. And Dawn is a diagnostic breast specialist at Mayo Clinic Florida, where she cares for women at an elevated risk for breast cancer, women undergoing active breast cancer treatment and breast cancer survivorship. And in 2015, Dawn developed the Integrative Medicine and Breast Health Program at Mayo Clinic Florida. So there's more I could tell, but she wants me to kind of leave some of that for her. You know, some of the surprises and some of her uh, background and some exciting other stories. So with that one, round of applause, a nice warm Minnesota welcome to Dr. Don. Thank you, Rochester Clinic, for having me. Thank you all for being here and being willing to listen to me. Ron, thank you for introducing me, and I am tickled to be here. I love my time with patients, but I love just as much. I don't want to say more because the time with patients is something I cherish so much, but it's so wonderful to be able to be with a group and to be able to engage with all of you today. So the one thing I don't have on here is that I am a miracle. I love saying that, but I really am a miracle, and I am going to be really excited to share a little bit about my story. So I have no disclosures. And I think what I'll do is I'll actually come over here so I can look at my slides so I don't have to look back so, so much. But I want you to just take a moment to picture what the perfect day of your life would be. And then what if that was your last living breath? So the Himalayan providence of Bhutan, they actually meditate on the concept of death five times a day. You're probably like, okay, get a little more positive quickly, right? But this is the happiest place in the world. And so a whole lifetime is needed to learn how to live, and perhaps you'll find this more surprising, that a whole lifetime is really needed to learn how to die as well. So I want you to just hear a, something that happened to me on this one very profound day. This was September 16th, 2016. And I had just finished seeing my patients for the morning. I'm always late because I like to spend as much time as I can possibly spend. But at this day at noon, I was so excited because it was the day I got to present to the Mayo Clinic leaders about the success of the integrative medicine and health program I had started at Mayo Clinic Florida. And this was a program that was set on the foundation of lifestyle medicine, where I work with women who are newly diagnosed with breast cancer and beyond to help them live their healthiest life possible. So of course I wanted to get to those stairs and get to that room to present. But as I approached these stairs, I stood at the top of the stairs and I remember my knees were kind of quivering. And I thought, what on earth is going on? And as I continued down the stairs, my legs felt profoundly weak. So as a doctor, I'm going through my mind, did I eat breakfast? Did I have too much caffeine? Am I nervous? I'm like, I'm, I'm not nervous. I love to talk. And I am so excited about telling them how incredible this program is so we can extend this program and expand it throughout the entire Mayo Clinic Florida community. But as I got to the bottom, I felt pretty unwell, but I continued to rush hastily to that boardroom where I knew I needed to present. There was a big, heavy door. As I went to open that door, I thought, oh my gosh, I, I I'm not good. So I shut the door and I remember just shutting my eyes and pausing and having a moment of just reflection and giving gratitude that I got to present to the, the folks in the boardroom. So as I opened the door, this is what I saw. And I remember thinking to myself, hmm, I would love to make kind of like a lighthearted comment just to uh, break this mood, but no, I didn't have time for that. So I sat at the top of the stair or the top of the table here and I grabbed the mouse and in the far distance was a screen. And I remember holding the mouse and moving the mouse. And as I moved the mouse, it was getting more and more pale. Have ever you tried to control the mouse? I felt like I couldn't even control it. And then I couldn't see it. And then this was my last conscious memory. So just take a moment with me. Go ahead and shut your eyes. I want you to experience with me what I experienced next. And so I was in this place of quietude. It was very cool, the air. I could feel almost a slight breeze. I want you to take notice of the still silence. This is a place of comfort. I remember having no fear, 
but there was complete acceptance of the complete unknowing. Again, there was this little bit of a breeze, and I remember this one strand of hair kind of stuck to my lip. It was kind of stuck on my lipstick. I felt as if my entire body was enveloped in love, and I described that it felt as if the hands of God were holding me. Now take a moment to just feel your own breath. Place your hand on your heart and feel its rhythmic beat. Just send a loving message to yourself. And go ahead and open your eyes. <coughs> so I'm going to take you to my backstory because this is really interesting. So as a little girl, when people would say, I was like four or five, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, I want to be in a Smucker's jar. So I don't know if any of you remember this, but the Willard Scott Today Show, they would honor the 100th birthday celebration. I thought this was so incredibly cool. And so my goal was to live to be 100, but to be healthy and vital. And I would also say I want to be a doctor. Fortunately enough, my family was very, very healthy, so they raised me in a very healthy environment. My favorite childhood memory, one of them, was going to the health food store back in the 1970s. And back then, like, all the grains were in the cool little freezer area. You'd walk in and you'd buy your grains in this cold section. It smelled so good. I remember that very, very clearly. So I went on to medical school just as I had planned. And actually, before I went to traditional medical school, I went to naturopathic medical school with the hopes of doing more holistic healing. Went on to osteopathic school to continue upholding kind of that more natural holistic scope of practice. But a few months in a medical school, I started not feeling well. I went and saw a doctor. This didn't make sense. I had never been sick my entire life. He said, you have asthma. I'm like, OK. I was a pretty avid runner, did mountain climbing twice a day. And I just couldn't perform the way I was used to. But the symptoms continued despite this inhaler. So I saw another doctor. He said, well, use it more. I'm like, OK, whatever. So I saw another doctor. He said, it's in my head. I'm like, what? This is not possible, right? So a few weeks later, I'm walking home from class. And I'm climbing my stairs to my apartment, and I collapse. I go to the emergency room. This is November 22nd, the day I collapse. That night, they did an x-ray, and this is what it looked like. There was a huge mass in my chest. I was in cardiogenic shock, so they had to rush me to the emergency room to try to pull off pieces of this tumor that was collapsing my lung and was occluding blood flow from getting out of my heart. They took samples of that tumor, and the next day they came in to tell me that I had a very aggressive form of diffuse B-cell lymphoma. And so the doctor, this was actually Thanksgiving, so it was an on-call doctor. He was... A, 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 a doctor that didn't give me much hope. He came in and he said, based on the images, you have stage four cancer. Without treatment, you have at best three months to live. And my dad's sitting right next to me, right? The dad who raised his little girl to be super healthy. And I'm 26 years old. And I just started medical school. Like, my, my life was, like, exactly how I'd always wanted it to be. <laughs> and I just paused. But he kind of caused this big rally in me. I'm like, well, you certainly don't know me. I want to be on that smucker's jar, you know? So he said, you need to quit medical school. There's no way you're going to be able to do these treatments and still be in medical school. And we have to start treatment immediately. So you're not going to be able to have kids. It was all these, you're not, you're not, you're not. So this really gave me this autonomous motivation to steer my own ship. I was going to do this my way. I learned a lot in naturopathic school. It's kind of very ironic. And one of my best friends from naturopathic school was actually starting the board certification course for naturopathic oncologists. And they trained right alongside the doctors at Mayo Clinic Arizona. So it was cool. So the next day was the Monday of that Thanksgiving uh, weekend. And my actual oncologist, Dr. Paul, had come in. And he was an amazing man. And he was very supportive about me using conventional care with holistic care. I stayed in medical school. I did uh, four months of CHOP chemotherapy. And then I needed a bone marrow transplant. Back then, you're the girl in the bubble. You know, back then, you're in the hospital for at least a month getting very high-dose chemotherapy. They drop your immune system down to zero. But I kept my life on track. I set my alarm at 4 o'clock every morning in the hospital. They brought a bike into my hospital room so I could ride my bike. They said at 4 in the morning, since all the other patients were in their rooms, I could sneak out of my room, and they put a bike that would overlook the Arizona Vista Mountains. And so it was just a beautiful experience. And this is what I remember. Looking out and seeing the other patients, and they were very sick. They were so sick. But I was not sick. I had this vibrant existence. Like, if there was something that was the green grass, the green for me was this vibrant green. There, I would hear birds that I don't even 
think anyone else heard birds, but I'd hear birds. I was fully alive. And at the time when some people are dying, I was experiencing complete awareness and vital existence more than anyone else has ever experienced. So I was cured of my stage four cancer, something that really probably shouldn't have happened. But with the conventional therapy and the study I was in, they were able to advance the science and I was able to help to mitigate some of those toxicities and feel really good with the holistic care I was receiving. So several uh, years went by, and so it's 2002, I started not feeling well again. I went to see a doctor. They thought maybe the cancer was back. They started doing a bunch of tests, PET scans, MRIs. There's no cancer. I had my annual gynecology exam, and I said, could I be pregnant? They're like, no, you're not. There's no way you're pregnant. You had all that chemo. So my husband and I found out that I was five months pregnant. <laughs> Another miracle. So we were able to grow our family. It was the most beautiful news we had ever imagined. So May 2nd, 2003, I gave birth to my daughter, Sophia. And then a few months after I delivered Sophia, I started out to feel well again. Same exact symptoms as cancer. So I was rushed to the emergency room, actually. And they had diagnosed me with cardiogenic shock once again, but I had advanced heart failure. My ejection fraction was 8%. And so the chemotherapy and the radiation they had to do, because that tumor was around my heart, it causes damage. And we knew this was a possibility. And then I had had the baby at such a close proximity. So it was very, very difficult. And they said I probably wouldn't be able to live very long without a new heart. And this was in 2003. So this is at a community hospital, because I was rushed by the emergency, you know, the ambulance to the hospital. So went to Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic filled my heart with hope. And they said, listen, Don, we are going to treat this with medicines first. When the medicines don't work, there's plenty of procedures. When the procedures don't work, you may need a transplant. This was in 2003. And that's exactly what they did. So they put me to physical therapy. I was able to continue eating my healthy diet. And I started feeling better. Did a lot of medications. But I started feeling better. I was able to go back to my training in medicine. I was able to go to residency. I was able to continue in that residency for as long as I could. It was 2007. I started not feeling good again. Had to take some time off of residency. And it was at this time that my husband died suddenly. And he died of sudden cardiac death. And he wasn't supposed to be the one that died. He had a very strong family history, though. So life took a big change. And this was actually the hardest thing for me in my life. I was kind of born with this happy gene. I joke about this. There is such a thing, actually. And I really think I was one of those very great, you know, very blessed people to be born with this. But I remember my existence feeling like it free fell. I go from this very heightened level of existence, even though I had my heart failure, not feeling good. I was the mom of a pretty young child, having to take time off of my dream job. And then I find my husband, and he passes away. And I just remember everything went to the ground floor quickly. It took me about nine months to get out of that. I remember any stimulation was too much for me to handle. I couldn't listen to music. I couldn't do anything. But if we can learn to transcend and experience this renewal, an inspired life is really an awakened life. And this was a time when I really connected to my faith in God. I was raised Roman Catholic, but this was really a time that I had to lean in on that deeply. And that's what really brought me through. And then it was really quite miraculous. Again, I actually started getting stronger. During that time in 2007, before my husband died, they did a procedure in my chest, an investigational procedure at that time, and I started getting better. And my ejection fraction even improved just a little bit, so I went back to work. I had to go back to work. And I got so well, I was actually able to do a fellowship in hospital medicine. So I became a hospital doctor for many years. That was intense. It's like one of the most intense jobs. I was working 21 days on call, big intense schedule. And then in 2015, I overdid it. Y you know, it was just too many years of working those many hours. And it was at that time that they had asked me if I would start and redesign the breast clinic at Mayo Clinic Florida. And that's when I had did that pilot with the Integrative Medicine and Health Program. So, you know, what I really learned during this whole time is that you have to show up for yourself. You have to listen to your body. And I love this analogy because when the heart beats, it keeps 5% of the blood for itself before it beats the blood to the rest of the body. And if it didn't do that, it couldn't sustain the rest of the body. But you know what I actually like most about this? The fact that 95% of that blood is going somewhere else. So that's us, right? That's us serving others. So this is a wonderful analogy on both ends of this. So let's go back to that day in the boardroom. 
This was 2016. So it was such an incredible experience. You know, in this very moment that we clinically call death, I was, I think, more awake than anyone else has ever experienced. This near-death experience also ignited this immense awakening. So after four minutes of being in a very fine ventricular fibrillation, and Dr. Sam Azurvatham was my electrophysiologist that had helped me after this event. He is a, a, I don't know, some of these folks in this room may know Dr. Sam Azurvatham. He is an electrophysiologist here at Mayo Clinic Rochester. He reviewed my images and he said, this is a miracle. He's like, your defibrillator did not save your life. He's like, because you had a flat line. There's no way it brought you back to life. So after four minutes, I spontaneously came back to life. And I remember this experience of coming back to life. And I remember this tsunami of energy that just went through my body. And it was like this mystic, miraculous moment of coming back alive. And I remember popping back up kind of on my butt and being like, OK, I can finish my presentation. <laughs> I had so much adrenaline. I was like, I feel good now. I am not weak. I am on fire. They were like, oh, no, you're going to lay back down, and you're going straight to the hospital, lady. <laughs> yeah, so I want to share this. So a few years went by. They did a bunch of more procedures from 2016 up to 2019. One complication after one complication after one complication. Oh, my gosh, I can't even begin to tell you. The things we do to patients, I was man, enough is enough. And then in 2019, they said, we are listing you for transplant. I said, amen, get this heart out of me. Give me a new one. I need to start living. My life has been on hold for all these years. So it is actually, there's a lot of great months. This is going to be Lifestyle Medicine Month in Rochester. It's Earth Day, and it's also Donate Life Month. So if you're not an organ donor, please consider it. One person who is an organ donor helps 75 lives. You save eight lives, and then there are 75 individuals that can be helped with tissue and uh, other, do uh, other donations. So think of that. You can donate, or you can sign up and register to be an organ donor on your iPhone app in the health section, or you can go to uh, registerme.org. But it's really interesting that 95% of people believe in organ donation, but only 58% actually register. <laughs> I know, it's sad. And so when I was listed, it was December of 2019. I had to wait over a year and still no call. And I was getting more sick and more sick. I was still working during this time. And during part of this time, I would, you know, I remember examining patients and just leaning into the table because I couldn't stand. My legs would be so weak. My hands would be blue. They'd be mottled. I remember I couldn't even walk to my car at the end of the day. I had to kind of walk a little bit and stop. I'd check my messages. I'd walk a little bit, stop, check my messages. I had this little skill that I would, when I felt like I was going to pass out from talking with my patients, I know that sounds crazy, but that's kind of what happened. I would throw out a question that I knew they would talk forever, like, so how was your vacation? How how, tell me how the family is. And they would talk. I'd be like, oh, I think I'm going to die. <laughs> you know, it was so difficult, but it was, they were really what gave me purpose, and they gave me reason to still keep fighting and to try to get through this. So I got so sick that in January of 2021, they had to actually admit me to the hospital su for supportive therapy. So I was admitted to the hospital, and on February 5th, 2021, my doctor came in the room and he said, we have a match. It's interesting, though, when they tell you that you think you'd be elated. It had been 18 years I had lived with heart failure. And I was so ready to, like, get my life back again. But it was the hardest news to hear. Here, someone has to die for you to live. And then all of a sudden, all those memories, all those memories that I had of my husband who passed away, of my daughter as a little girl, of my childhood, are going to be removed, maybe, if this physical heart, in fact, holds memories. Or is it just a metaphorical heart? Or is it just a, it, who knows, right? I didn't know. I remember having a colleague of mine who was a psychiatrist coming in and sitting with me when I was listed for transplant. And he goes, Dawn, do you really want a transplant? Aren't you worried your personality is going to change? I'm like, <sighs> the dumb things people say. He's still a friend. He knows whenever I say this, he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. So then the next thing out of my doctor's mouth was, Dawn, I have one more thing to tell you. Your donor is an IV drug user, and she has hepatitis C. I'm like, oh, no, 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 why me, why me, this is very bad. <laughs> is it a full moon? Why is this happening? And so I said, I need to think about this. I need to think about this. Because in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about what my colleague told me. Your personality can change. And I'm thinking, what if she wasn't happy? What if I'm not going to be happy? It was so much to process. 
So within a few hours, I knew that this was the right thing for me. And in fact, I thought it was actually an incredible thing. Here's a young woman. Maybe she did drugs because she wasn't happy. And maybe I could teach her and give her this beautiful life that I had known for my entire life. So the next day, you know, it takes a lot of tests. When they find out you have the organ, it's like, it's like, oh my gosh, you've never done so many tests in such a short period of time, but they have to make sure everything's ready to go. They take me down to the operating room. I remember getting contact, contact, eye contact with my surgeon, Dr. Sariapaglu, and I had no fear. He's a dear friend of mine, no fear. Can you imagine? You're, you're moments away from your heart being removed and you have no fear. How does that happen? It was the coolest thing. I was so ready. And I trusted him. And I trusted Mayo Clinic. I knew I was in such good hands. I remember every other surgery except for this one going under anesthesia. I'd pray, quick, please, please make sure I wake up. Please make sure I wake up. I didn't do any of that this time. I just remember praying and just giving thanks for the donor, the donor family, probably what, what they were experiencing. I can't imagine that hurt. I've never met my donor family. They actually never responded to me. You are able to write a letter, but I never heard back from them. So I don't know um, the circumstances centered around her life. So <coughs> this is my heart, and that's my surgeon with my heart. So that's in my body. So that's pretty cool. I don't think many people have that opportunity to see what their heart looks like. And so this is me the day after. Uh, this is me many days after surgery. There were there were several complications, but I want to describe something. When I woke up for my transplant, it was the most amazing experience. I remember for the first time in 18 years, my body felt warm. When you have heart failure, you're so cold, like Rochester cold. <laughs> maybe not cold. <laughs> maybe not quite that cold. But you're pretty. You're pretty cold. You're kind of cold. I like to exaggerate a little bit. I'm not exaggerating about the story, but that that part maybe is a little exaggerated. But I was warm for the first time. My mind, I could think clearly. It was so cool. And I remember feeling my heart beating against the bed. I was like, what on earth is going on? <laughs> my whole body was like beating up and down against the bed. My heart, it was beating. I, I didn't know you could feel your heart beat because I hadn't felt my weak heart beat ever. Like for 18 years, I forgot what it felt like to feel your heart beat. It was beating so forcibly that my hair was like kind of dancing on the crisp white sheets and it was like singing. I'm like, this is wild. And then I remember that every single cell in my body was like oscillating at this higher vibrational frequency. It was like a thrill. I was just like, oh my God. I was like, I was like, am I really alive? <laughs> this is cool. It was like better than any drugs. I was like, oh, maybe this is why she did drugs. I don't know. I think now I have a drug. It was amazing. But man, this was awesome. So this was them when they finally, after I woke up, they get you to the chair right away. The funny thing is, is they were out of heart pillows. They give you these organ donation pillows. And so they gave me a set of lungs. So that pillow is actually lungs. But I really did have a heart transplant. I said, are you guys sure you give me a heart, not lungs, right? So this is a pretty cool picture, though, because you really are pretty weak. These are my first steps after transplant. I've actually not shared these pictures, but it's pretty amazing. Like, you were on a whole bunch of medicines. I was actually really sick. I had a lot of complications after my transplant. They were pretty weak about me um, because of all that radiation and stuff. So that's why I still had so many IVs going. I remember how hard those steps were. And prior to my transplant, I had set this goal. I told my colleagues, you know, I want to run a marathon after transplant. They're like, oh, that's a dawnism, sure. Maybe a half marathon. I'm like, no, I want to do a full marathon. So when I took this first step, I'm like, uh-oh, <laughs> this may not happen. This is going to be really hard. But I thought, hmm, what if I did the whole food plant-based diet and live this perfect life like I do? I think I could do this. But those steps are really hard, so I wasn't sure. But I still wanted to kind of set that goal forth. My medical team was willing to support me. A few days after transplant, I remember I got really angry. So happy little happy Jean Dawn got mad. I was so mad that I got this heart from an IV drug user that had, had hepatitis C. I had found out that my hepatitis C viral load was in the million. And then my insurance company said, oh, we're not going to cover that medicine to treat your hepatitis C until you get discharged from the hospital. I'm like, well, that's a big problem because I have a lot of stuff going on. I don't know when I'm going to get discharged from this hospital. So now I have this like rampant hepatitis C. My insurance isn't covering the medicines. So I go to bed that night. So I'm angry. It kind of felt fun to be angry. Actually, it felt kind of like sassy. But I had a dream. And I woke up in this dream. It was more like a sensory experience. And in this dream, I woke up in this dwelling place. It was like this concrete building. I remember seeing a window. So I ran to the window to look and see if my car was there. There was no car. 
there was one chair. And I remember thinking, is my purse on the chair? My purse wasn't on the chair. And then there was a door. So I remember kind of crawling out this door. And there were these long blades of grass. And these blades of grass were kind of grabbing my leg. Do you remember as a kid or even maybe as an adult when you're walking through grass and it kind of grabs your skin and almost feels like it's going to cut your leg? That's what the grass felt like. It was sticking to my leg as I'm crawling through this grass. And I flip over. There's these cumulus clouds going overhead. And in the distance, there are these families that are just together, playing, laughing in this blissful existence. And then they came over me, and it was grace. So I woke up at that very moment, and I thought, hmm, I'm going to name my heart Grace. And it was right then and there that I knew that everything was going to be okay. But it gets better. So I always listened to instrumental music in the hospital when I would sleep, and the song playing at that very moment was titled Grace. It's pretty powerful. So I couldn't sleep after that. So I opened my email, and there was an email waiting for me titled Full of Grace. <laughs> this was really interesting. So grace is my heart. And, you know, grace was kind of a virtue from God and just this knowing that it will be okay, but also to maybe fill your life with deep purpose. I love Lisa Miller. She is a physician that does research out of Columbia. She is the author of The Awakened Brain. She's done some amazing podcasts, and she really talks about the science behind spirituality. We're all born with a spiritual core. And, you know, you can perfect lifestyle medicine as much as you want, but if you don't really fulfill that spiritual core, then I, I don't know if people can really live an optimal existence. But she's beautiful, and I really love how she introduces the science behind spirituality. So, you know, the meaning of life is to find your gift, but the purpose of life is to share it with others. And this really infuses our life with so much inspiration, direction, creativity. And when you have purpose, you can kind of set out to do whatever you want to do, right? And it, it was here waiting for me. It was like the second wind on life. A and I had just this, like, fire in the belly desire to do so much. And I still do. It's like, God, I hate saying no. I just want to say yes to everything because everything is so important to be alive. <laughs> and there seems like there's no end, dead ends. Nothing seems impossible. It's like everything is possible. And so I did run that marathon on my one-year transplant anniversary. I was the first person in the world to ever do it. No man has ever done this. <laughs> so excited. There was one man in the 70s that did it, and he did it 15 months after transplant. I did it 12 months. I was so excited. But you have to look at this. You cannot make this up. This is the finish line, and this is the construction sign. So it was pretty powerful. Uh, not pretty. It was like crazy powerful. And this is one of my nurse practitioners. who She's an ultra uh, uh, marathoner. She does Ironman triathlons. And she just did the Boston Marathon with this like, record time. So she had come at the end of the race to kind of run with me. And one of my other friends who is doing the London Marathon uh, this weekend, she was the one who took this picture. She's like, Dawn, look at that side. It's Grace. <coughs> and then look at my number. It was 365, which wasn't planned. It was 365 days after my transplant. So it's kind of like serendipity, right? These are my colleagues. They were so supportive during my entire heart failure time. There were so many times when there was complications. I'd have to get admitted and all this stuff. I'm like, don't worry about it, Don. We got you. I mean, just incredible people. Such love. So how does this, all, how does this happen? Like, I mean, I don't know. I, I hear my story. I, I don't actually like sharing my story because I feel like it's kind of so self-ish to like share your story. But if it can help inspire others, then that's what I want to do. But I think it comes to being a little gritty. And every transplant patient is gritty. Every can cancer patient is gritty. Anyone with disease, you, you have to develop the grit if you're going to get through it. But this was my little recipe to how I got through it. So number one is I never let go of that purpose in my life, that four-year-old, five-year-old dream of being a doctor, right, and delivering original medicine through that lens of love, connecting and caring for others, and especially this sort of medicine. Wow. Not just to, you know, maybe give a pill, but to really help people experience their aliveness. Oh, it's so cool to see that, I, I'll tell you. And that's what we're designed to do, is to really connect and care for others. And to always know that life is really about something so much bigger than us. The next was I really controlled my thoughts. We have to control our thoughts. And I really flipped that script on cancer and on heart failure. 
in any adversity that, that comes our way. <coughs> and probably the most important is this, to give gratitude. Gratitude takes us from a place of deficit to abundance, right? It fills us with optimism. And I was so grateful for so much, my gosh, for my donor, for my medicine, for my amazing family, for my colleagues. And I think the, the thing I am so grateful for the most is my belief in God. That belief in something bigger than myself, to just trust and know, know that everything is going to be okay. And I share that with my patients. The coolest thing is that I've been through what I've been through. So I have like a good, strong, it's probably not intuition, it's just I've been there. So I can really guide them. I know how to kind of navigate through and help them. It's such a blessing. So post-traumatic growth is a real thing if you embrace it. I mean, and this is where you can really find possibilities and strengths to just go really far and beyond, but you really want to focus on that purpose. And my number one purpose is my family, and this is my daughter, Sophia. And, you know, it's interesting because my life was really on hold for so many years. And so you really can't travel for that first year after transplant. So this is this past summer. We went to Iceland and we chased waterfalls. It was so cool. And this is like a dream I, I'd always wanted to do. So we had a lot of fun. And it was exciting. And this is my second purpose. This is my patients. So these are 40 breast cancer patients, and they did the Donna Marathon, uh, the Donna 5K with me. And this is an example of someone with stage 1 to 4, meaning metastatic breast cancer, who are in the middle of treatment, and they look pretty darn good. And this is a miracle right here. This is Michelle Mecca. She actually had uh, metastatic cancer to her brain, and there's no evidence of her disease any longer. And I never hear from her anymore because she's busy traveling the world and speaking for the American Cancer Society and doing amazing things. She's on her plant-based diet, but she is remarkable. So this is how these ladies look when they apply lifestyle medicine to treatment. And man, does my purpose cultivate awe. Like, I have chills right now. Like, I don't know if you do. You may not. But anything we do in life, you should really go after those aha moments. Fill that life with awe. It gives you those neurotransmitters, those hormones that just feel so good, right? Those could probably cure cancer or at least help. It helps us move towards this existence of love, and that's really what we want to do in life. So let's kind of move to a little bit of the medicine. So this was adapted from Dean Ornish's slide. I'm sure most of you have seen this. How many of you have seen this before, this diagram similarly? So I love this. So Mayo Clinic doctors, we can use this slide. This is made for us to use. I love it because it helps really explain medicine, right? So the faucet is on, the drain is plugged, water is going all over the floor, and this is what we do so often, at least in cancer care, right? We mop up the floor. This is our chemo, our radiation, our surgery. We need to do that. I mean, cancer is a pretty evil thing, so we have to come at it with evil things right back at it. But we know that if that faucet in the analogy is lifestyle, what if we turned off the faucet to try to prevent maybe some cancers from happening? Or if we turn off that faucet and we help people to have an enhanced quality of life during treatment, pretty important. So 60% of Americans have at least one chronic disease. That's substantial. And I th think we all know that this number is rising, right? According to the American Cancer Society, 740,000 cancers don't have to happen each year. They're preventable if people lived healthier. That's a little hard for me to digest, right? And the CDC says if people just lived a little healthier, we could save 1.1 million lives every year. So this is what the Rochester Clinic is doing. They're helping people live healthier lives. So we can help to prevent disease, treat disease, and in some cases, reverse chronic disease. And these are all the diseases that we can help. It's pretty much every single thing out there. I love this study. It's an older study, but it really kind of helps us to understand the magnitude of healthy living. And this isn't perfect living. Nothing that we do has to be perfect, unless being perfect with your healthy living is something that empowers you. I don't have a problem with that, as long as you're excited about it, not turbulent about it. So this study had 23,000 people. They followed them for almost eight years. This is the EPIC study. And it showed that those people who lived a healthy lifestyle, they had a 93% reduced risk of type 2 diabetes, the kind of diabetes that's preventable an 81% reduced risk of having a heart attack, 50% reduced risk of stroke, and a 36% reduced risk of all cancers. The American Cancer Society said it's even higher than this, right? So here is my contact information. I have about, do I have 15 more minutes? Is that right? 
I want I know that time we were a little so I can stop here I can go a little bit further so what would you like for me to do should I take questions now and I think what I would say is I have a stopping point here because I never know how long it takes me to get through things and I've learned what would you guys like you want me to stop here and take questions or I can because I think I have 45 minutes right we started at I looked at the clock we started at 9 30. you got a couple minutes yet a couple sure okay <laughs> Okay. Well, let's do Does that. Does anybody have any questions? And oh. we could do the questions at the break if you want. I'll just, I was just, what I'm going to do is just go over a few of the pillars of lifestyle medicine uh, that the Rochester Clinic does and maybe just show a few little studies. But we're going to have amazing speakers talking about lifestyle medicine all day long. So I'm not going to get into the depths of it because you're going to learn from them. I would say I think the most important pillar of lifestyle medicine is this purpose, passion. Because if you don't have a strong enough reason why to live healthy, then why live healthy, <laughs> right? So this to me is number one. I'm not going to talk about it because I just talked about it. <laughs> My whole life has been about pur purpose and passion. So hopefully that helps to explain the need of us to find our why or our purpose. This is my favorite, though, is nutrition. And I really feel that the nutrition aspect of this is what is what sets me apart from every other transplant patient is what set me apart from every other cancer patient is why I was able to attain that heightened vitality and flourish after transplant. All the transplant patients have grittiness, but none of them flourish. I was sharing with Dr. Carlson after my transplant, I was on 75 pills a day. They were colorful. I was getting the rainbow, but they were in pills. I would get so full. I'm like, I can't eat any more fiber. I'm pill full. So nutrition matters. And this is the craziest statistic, and you could fact check this, but 678,000 Americans die every year because of food-related chronic disease. This is more deaths than we have had in all US wars and combat. That's very hard to, to comprehend. So the Journal of the American Medical Association, so why do doctors not get medical training? Why do they not understand this stuff? This is last year. Poor diet is associated with a leading cause of death. So we know this. 90% of Americans don't get five servings of vegetables and fruits a day. I think it's higher than this. I would say it's about 98% of my patients, they come in. We have something called the social determinants of health. I always look at that. Two to three vegetables and fruits a day. That's what I see. That's where they're at or less. I had a woman coming in um, on Friday. She had zero to one. Three out of four Americans don't get a piece of fruit each day. But the last one's most startling. Our youth, 67% of our children's diet is ultra processed foods. And we're not much better. Ours is about 63%, but probably higher, probably 70%. Because where you see 12% plant foods, half of that is processed. So the average American is only getting 6% of plant foods in their diet. The other 6% is processed. So the average American is probably closer to 70% processed foods. And so a lot of patients come in to see me and they say, Dr. Dawn, I'm vegan. I'm like, uh-oh, what does vegan mean? So this study really helps me communicate to them that that is not good. I want you to be whole food. I think that's actually the most important part of that whole thing, plant-based, right? So this study had 65,000 French women, and they looked at women doing an animal-based diet versus a plant-based diet. And of course, the plant-based diet's better, right? But they looked at that a little bit further. Th so those people on the plant-based diet that was healthy, the whole foods, had a 14% reduced risk of breast cancer. But those people on the processed plant diet had a 20% increased risk of breast cancer. Processed food is very bad for us. So no to processed foods. There's more than 10,000 chemicals in the US diet. You know, I, I'm not gonna go over these obviously, but these are things that you're all aware of. These are things we want to avoid, they're not good. But here's some great studies. So this is what's so interesting, is other countries pay deep attention to this. So this is the UK. And I'm like, why are you guys studying this? Their ultra-processed food consumption was only 22.9%. Ours is 60 to 70%, and they're investigating this. And what they showed for every 10 percentage point increase above that 22.9%, there was an increased risk of cancer happening. That's no surprise. 
But look at these numbers, this increased risk of ovarian cancer. And if a woman gets ovarian cancer, she has a 30% increased risk of, risk of dying from it. If a woman gets breast cancer with ultra-processed foods, she has a 16% increased risk of dying from it. These are startling numbers. So in Brazil, even more surprising that they're studying it because their ultra-processed food intake is 13 to 21%. But what they showed it was linked to premature mortality. People are dying younger and they don't need to die. And when they helped reduce the ultra-processed food, they saw they could save almost 30,000 lives. So that's amazing. But this food hacks our brain, like literally it hacks our brain, right? Ultra-processed food, it makes us want to come back for more and more and more, literally. Up here in the brain, that's why food manufacturers do it, because we come back for more and more and more. But it also makes us not think as good, so we have faster rates of cognitive decline. We, we want to preserve our brain. Dr. Dean Ornish is doing beautiful research right now in this area to actually see if you can reverse Alzheimer's dementia with whole food plant-based nutrition and exercise and loving relationships and social connection. So you all know this. I mean, most of you guys are doing this, right? This whole food plant-based diet. So how many fruits and vegetables should we have a day? And I know Brenda's going to go into a lot of this, but the research says at a minimum five. That's where we get the most bang for our buck. But there was a great scientist that said, hey, let's just see if a little bit more is better. And in fact, it is. You continue to get benefit up to 10. And there's some suggestion maybe even 13 to 14 servings a day is a benefit. And remember, one serving is about the size of the fist. But I really like this. So when individuals got five servings of vegetables and fruits a day versus two a day, there was a 13% improved survival. There was a 10% reduced risk of dying from heart disease. 10% reduced risk of dying from cancer. And this last one is very interesting, a 35% reduced risk of dying from respiratory disease. And this is why I like this slide. Because with COVID, we really got crazy. I mean, it was important. I'm not minimizing this, so I should have been. But wear your mask, get your vaccine, wear your mask, get your vaccine. But no one ever told people to eat healthier. But we really should have probably like considered that too. Because look at this. Individuals who ate this plant-based diet they had a reduced risk of moderate to severe COVID. And those that didn't, those that were on a keto diet, had a three and a half times more likely chance of dying. So that's why I bring up that fruit and vegetable side, because I know you're going to hear a lot about it, but man, for COVID, for respiratory disease, that's a really fascinating statistic. When I read that study, I was like, 35%, it was really hard to believe, right? And I love this. This is a good, like, little hook you start to feel good after just a few days of a whole food plant-based diet. After two weeks, your skin looks more beautiful. Love that, right? I have women coming in all the time. What skin products do you recommend? Like, just eat healthy. You don't, and use any lotion. I don't put coconut oil on your face. I don't care what you put on your face. Just eat healthy. That's what will make you look youthful. And after three weeks, there's a 10% reduced risk of dying from any cause. And we all love the last one because we could keep our girlish figure. After four weeks, <coughs> five to eight pounds of weight loss. And I actually see higher numbers in my patients. I was sharing with some colleagues that on Thursday, I had a woman. She has metastatic breast cancer, and she has been on her whole food plant-based diet for six months. She's lost 40 pounds. It's a lot of weight. She still wants to lose more. I'm like, you don't need to lose more. Her BMI is right about 25 to 26. Now she's like, no, I just want to lose a little bit more. But it's very cool because her husband is a liver transplant patient at Mayo Clinic, and he's whole food plant-based too. So he told his doctors he was whole food plant-based, and they were like, mm, we don't know if you should do that. And so they called me, and I said, I'll follow him. So I follow him too. He's not a breast cancer patient, but he's a liver transplant patient, and he's amazing. He's in his 70s, and no one can slow this man down. So they're both just this incredibly vital couple uh, who are doing terrific. So movement, we know that physical activity is the fourth leading cause of death, and we know that when you move, you'll have less disease. So researchers have showed that when people sit for more than eight hours a day, and when they don't exercise, that it equals the same risk as being obese or smoking. Uh-oh. I know. So we're going to make you sit all day today, so make sure you stand up. <laughs> so stand up. And then every two hours of sitting increases the risk of many cancers, especially endometrial cancer and liver cancer. But this is kind of nice because some people say, I'm just not going to do it. I don't have 30 minutes a day. I say, whoa, anything is better than nothing. And so these recent studies are, are kind of interesting. We see that you can have a health benefit with just simply doing 77 minutes a week. That's 11 minutes a day. 
So I tell my patients, even if you don't feel like moving, just go walk for five to 10 minutes. As soon as you do that, you'll feel better and they'll do the full 30, right? And we see that with steps, you know, usually we say 10,000 steps, 12,000 steps, but we actually see that we can reduce deaths from premature causes 50 to 70% by just getting 7,000 steps a day. So any movement matters. But I love this one because I like to run marathons now that I can. So is that healthy or is that bad? Is there such a thing as too much exercise? Well, this study said no. So I was really happy to see this. So I showed this to my doctors. No, I'm not going to hurt myself. So this study showed that, in fact, if you do exercise over 600 minutes a week, there's no harm. But you no longer get that added benefit. But what the study showed is currently we feel 150 to 300 minutes a week is where you get all the bang for your buck. Nope. It seems like 599 minutes a week is where you get all the bang for your buck. Isn't that a ridiculous number? I'm like, I just rounded up to 600, so it says 600 here. But 600 minutes a week, that's where you can get all the bang for your buck. Anything more than that isn't going to hurt you. You can enjoy it, but you're not going to get any added benefit. Well, you may emotionally because the endorphins feel so good when you exercise. So social connections, love. Dean Ornish does a lot of this work. In fact, I, his book is for sale here, that Undo It book. It's a beautiful book to listen to also on Audible because you can hear the love in his voice and the love in his wife's voice. They both narrate that book on uh, Audible. Beautiful book. 60% of people in the United States report feeling lonely. And so this study had 300,000 people, and it showed that weak social ties are as harmful as being an alcoholic and two times more harmful than being obese. So this is why whole person health matters, right? We shouldn't just talk in one silo. It's not just about nutrition, or it's not just about exercise. It's about whole person health, exactly what the Rochester Clinic is doing. But the reason I love social connections, and this kind of gives me a nice speaking path with patients, because I can't just like talk about spirituality out of, the, out of the blue, right? And social connections can be horizontal, loving connections with all of us, but also vertical, and that would be our spiritual connection. So I love that, so keep that in mind. But here are some of the stats when it comes to loneliness. There's a 50% increased risk of dementia. There's a 29% increased risk of heart disease and a 32% increased risk of stroke. We know that it really contributes, obviously, to mental health. That's not a surprise, right? And we would think that, oh, well, at least we can fulfill those social connections with social media, but that's not the case. It actually makes it worse. And then among heart failure patients, those who were lonely had nearly a four times risk of dying, a 68% increase of going to the hospital, and a 57% increase of going to that emergency room. So, of course, stress, we all have it, but we have to learn how to manage it properly, right? A lot of folks ask about meditation. We're fortunate at Mayo Clinic. We do have a, a nice uh, service that I offer to my patients. That's a mindfulness and a stress management concept that works with deep breathing and relaxation exercises. But I have a lot of women that struggle with just sitting and meditating. So for me, yoga is a really wonderful thing to work with my patients. And there's a lot of free yoga videos that are online. And so then you'll get your movement and some of your peacefulness. This is the one I say for last because I am terrible at this one. But we all need to be better because when it comes to sleep, it is critical. It's when your bath gets, it's when, it's when your brain gets its little bath. So seven to nine hours is what the goal is, really no less. And you don't need more. So seven to nine hours is the goal. And when it comes to sleep, blue light exposure is one of the main problems. So when you wake up in the morning, get your face in that bright sun. When the sun's going down, get your face in that sundown time too. Get that sun exposure and eliminate blue light. If you need to do work late at night, anytime after that sun's going down, wear your blue light glasses or put a blue light screen over that TV monitor. If you snore at night or if you have poor sleep quality, please ask your doctor to do an overnight oximetry. This really is a big disturbing factor when it comes to metabolic health. So this is my last two slides. So as part of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, I was given a lovely grant to help to train 20,000 healthcare providers across the United States. But any of you who are healthcare providers, you can get 5.5 free CMEs with this link. And this is also going to be shared with our Mayo Clinic employees wide, widely, but you can go and get this today. 
But for those of you who aren't healthcare providers, feel free to do this as well. It's a wonderful 5.5 um, hours of education with Introduction to Lifestyle Medicine, and it goes into that food as medicine. It's very lovely. Just when you do the initial uh, survey, it'll ask you about some of your clinical experience. Just click not applicable, okay? But there's a QR code. It'll take you right to the sign up. You'll sign up for an account through the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And when you do that, there's no fee. It's a $279 education um, experience, but that's waived as soon as you use that code, ESS Mayo. You, you would need just to type that in, okay? The other really nice thing is once you have that account through the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, again, it's free. There is a lot of lovely resources, including a food as medicine jumpstart guide, uh, um, whole food plant-based nutrition on a budget with some great recipes. Okay. All right. That's it. Ooh, that's pretty, I was almost, it's pretty timely. <laughs> I'm getting better. I love to talk. It's so lovely. All right. Thank you all so much for your time. I'll be around for questions, and of course you can email me too. Thank you. Round of applause for Dr. Dawn. Inspirational, thank you very much. And uh, some of that I can uh, relate to as well. It's very nice, that especially about the exercise part. I've got, you know, had cancer in my family, and uh, especially the uh, transplant story. My wife's actually a heart-lung transplant coordinator here at Mayo as well. So thank you very much for your inspiration.